welcome Peter Harrison, the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Queensland, and uh, my privilege and honor to be working with you as the co-director of the Meanings of Science Project and Symposium, funded generously by the Templeton World Charity Foundation. I'm really excited to, to interview you, and I want to sort of just share a brief summary of how I see your work for the people listening and, um, and watching this. And I think it's fair to say you've, you've really revolutionized sort of three fields that were thought of, I think, and particularly before your work, as much more separate than you've shown them really to be. And those are broadly speaking, the history of theology, the history of modern philosophy, and the history of the natural sciences. And in particular, you were decades ahead of what has now become in religious studies a, a trend when you wrote your first book on the emergence of the concept of religion, which I'd love to, to talk about this when we talk about your intellectual development. And then you wrote a really extraordinary book on the Bible and Protestantism and the rise of modern science in which you engaged the major historiographical theses about the origins of modern science and religion, and you really did challenge and modify many of them. And in particular, which we can discuss, you argue that there was a very profound connection between the way in which the Protestant Reformation changed how people read the Bible, and then how that changed how we read literally the world. And so I, that book in particular is how I found your work, and I thought it was just an utterly extraordinary argument in terms of its significance and the how much I learned from it. And then a book of particular excitement for me personally, because I've always been interested in the fall, maybe like a heretic, like Augustine says, um, is The Fall of Man and the Foundations of Science, which I think is, you know, we can discuss in detail, but a really extraordinary book because you you really challenge the entire sort of meta story about um, the origins of science. And particularly, you tell a radically new story about the origins of experimental science. So you started off working on the concept of religion. Then you did very major work on the history of theology, textual interpretation, the Protestant Reformation, and the emergence of modern science. Then you develop that work into the fall of man and the foundations of science in this pretty revolutionary reassessment, building on some existing work, of course, but really a, a significant reassessment of where did experimental philosophy come from, which is one of the things, of course, I, I want us to talk about and get your thoughts so that people can learn from your work on this is we take experiments for granted. But of course, one of the things you show in the book is experimental science was a radically novel thing. And so it raises deep questions about why would anyone have done this and what were their reasons? And you show, I think, very persuasively the reasons were very theological and they were very much to do with the revival of Augustine and Protestantism. And then in a way, as far as I can chart the trajectory of your work, you brought together, um, you know, just your whole career to that point and advanced it in your book, The Territories of Science and Religion. And I believe these first three books are published by Cambridge and this book was published by uh, University of Chicago, I believe in 2016. And that I believe was based in your Gifford lectures in which you really, I think, you basically made a kind of a point in the field at which no one who's really in the field of science and religion can turn back from, which is you really show the entire field of science and religion, productive and interesting as it is, is in a very deep sense, a kind of anachronism, if we don't recognize that the very categories of science and religion are themselves much more recent than anyone has ever realized. And of course that builds on your early work on religion, and then on the prior two books on science. And now I know, and maybe we can discuss this, I know you're working on a major project on secularization. So I could not be more delighted and honored to speak to you. And in light of this incredible body of work, and the fact that we're both YDS alums, um, I would love to just hear, how did you get into this extraordinary sort of program of research? What led you into maybe your first academic interests? Um, you obviously have a command of the history of modern philosophy, theology, and science, but did you start off with those interests or could you tell us a bit about how did you get into this work? Yeah, well, look, look, well thanks for that. Thanks for that very generous introduction. I'm, I'm really glad to know that you've, you've appreciated the, um, and my work. Um, ha, look, like, like any historical story, I think there's a lot of contingencies involved in how I, how I got to where I am. And, and to some extent, I feel really fortunate that the things I've been working on just seem to fall into place in terms of ways of relating to each other. But if I go right back, you know, my initial undergraduate training was in the natural sciences. So I studied essentially the biological sciences mostly. 
although I had, to, for various reasons, I had to do chemistry and so on. So um, I was initially interested in the sciences, and for, for several years I taught science at secondary schools oh. um, and then became interested, as a, as a high school teacher, I mean, I, which I really enjoyed, um, but I did become interested in the broader kind of issues about, you know, what science is, what its, what its meaning is, how, how we got it. Um, and so I, I went back um, and, and did another uh, undergraduate degree in, the, in arts, and it's actually mostly in religious studies. Um, and at that point, I also had some theological interest. And so I studied the, the, the major, you know, the giant Swiss theologian, Karl Barth, and Bart actually has some very interesting things to say about the concept of religion. So in the field of religious studies, there was discussion about the concept of religion, but there's also this matching discussion going on in theology, certainly under the influence of someone like Bart, who was very critical of this conception of, of religion. And that, so my, my early interest in the conception of religion came then and kind of science was, was in the background. And so after my PhD, um, which uh, there was an interlude at Yale, as you've, you've mentioned, where I studied um, ph philosophy and, again, religious studies, with, with a, including a very important um, person, Hans Frey, who worked on the interpretation of the Bible. So that was another part of the story. But I went back to the University of Queensland and completed my PhD on the concept of religion, and that then became my first book and in essence as you know it's that that religion is is not something that the religious traditions themselves as a concept buy into but is a kind of invention of the early modern period and then it affects the way we understand religious beliefs and practices under this banner religion um and, and as for science as i say it was always there in the background and it, it my sense about the history of science was that once you understand once you look back at the history it's it's clear that the natural sciences um, up until the 19th century in essence are permeated with theological and philosophical conceptions. And the same is true for the history of philosophy, although you wouldn't know it to read many contemporary histories of philosophy, but essentially philosophy is deeply theological. And, 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 and so there were kind of these missing components to the history of philosophy and the history of science that I thought as someone who was interested in theological conceptions could actually bring these to the history and put them back in um, to, to where they essentially belonged. Um, and, I, and I think in addition to that sort of basic kind of, of approach, it's, it's been become increasingly clear to me that the, the modern categories, and this is part of the same story, the modern categories that were used to interpret the past, categories like science and religion and categories like some of the categories I'm working on now and the distinction between the natural and the supernatural, that in, in intellectual culture, we just take these for granted and as givens, as if they're sort of sort of written into the structure of the universe. But once we attend to the history, what we see is that a number of these concepts are historically very idiosyncratic, very unusual. And what it means is that when we assume them to be natural and we look back to the past and we read them into the past, we get a kind of completely distorted idea of what the historical actors themselves imagine themselves to, to, to be doing. Um, and in order to get insights into how, how history actually functions, we need to, you know, it's, it's kind of obvious point, but we need to think ourselves back into the thought worlds of these earlier people. And that means, you know, disabusing ourselves of the idea that the present repertoire of, of analytic concepts that we have to, to look at history, that these are somehow universally valid when, in fact, they're often the contingent historical products of a long historical process. So telling that kind of genealogical story about how we got these concepts is also part of my general approach to these, these sorts of questions. And that point, which you say in one sense is obvious, is as you know, in a much more you know minor way at this point. But I have, I have the same interests, and and I think I think you would maybe concede that in a way it's obvious because every historian would say yes, put the historical period you're studying into its historical context. However, um, once you actually do that with concepts, it really begins to challenge the entire structure of even the academy. 
And so would you call yourself, I'm curious about this, would you call yourself a historicist? Or certainly, would you consider a, a mode? I know the term is contested and we don't have to get into that unless you want to, but I do see your work as being partly, um, from my standpoint, it's part of what distinguishes it is you, I see you as radically historicist, but somehow not in a way that ever makes a person think you would be a relativist. However, you just seem to me to practice the historical methods scientifically in such a way that by just taking seriously what we know, these are contingent, they're not universal, we have to localize them. But how do you see your own identity in that practice, say vis-a-vis -vis the broader academy and the ways in which maybe even though it is in a sense obvious, it's, it's also very challenging to even our, you know, contemporary colleagues in many fields. Yeah, so look, I I'm not overly concerned with labels. To be honest, I find it hard to locate myself in a kind of stand. I'm, I don't know whether I'm a historian or a philosopher or a historian of philosophy or whatever. And so I tend not to worry about that. You know, I, I think in terms of method, I, I, I'm a bit of a fan of Paul Feyerabend. He said, you know, in the history of science, when you look at what people are doing, it appears in terms of methods, anything goes. And, and to some extent for me, I use whatever tools I've, I can uh, to hand to attempt to understand the past. That, that's kind of the broad picture. In terms of relation to the academy, look, I, the, the, the issue that you've raised I think is a really interesting one because to some level I think it's crucial to maintain that to some extent you've got to stay within, if you're interested in persuading people and you're interested in communicating within the contemporary academy, you've, you've got to maintain connections and and to some extent you've got to do a work of translation in terms of these categories you can't throw them all up in the air um, and uh, because you cease then to have any common language with with which to engage the academic community and I do think it's important to engage both the academic community and and the public if you can although that's a challenge um, historicist so Look, I think the relative the relativism question is really interesting because I, I don't, whereas I've said these contemporary, these modern categories that, that we use in the academy as analytic categories and, and that they systematically distort the past and we should get rid of them, it doesn't follow from that necessarily that everything is up for grabs and there are no fundamental underlying, what, what I think, what the, the position I'm coming to is 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 to to look at how idiosyncratic the modern range of conceptions are in terms of, and this relates to the secularization thesis in relation to notions of sec, a secular understanding of the world and a naturalistic understanding of the world. But if you compare this to other periods of history and to other cultures, this is the radical exception. So m my point would be not that it's cultural relativism all the way down, but rather the, the one culture that we need to think seriously about relativizing some of the dominant conceptions is our own, at our own moment in history. Um, but I, I don't think it necessarily follows from that, that, you know, we, we need, therefore, to, to buy into a thoroughgoing relativism. And what appear to be cultural constants, I think, historically and, and cross-culturally. Now, that's a very ambitious claim to make, but that's my, my deep sense, if it makes any sense. Oh, it does make sense. I think the recording might have cut out just at the last part. So could you say what the, the last uh, claim was again? Just I want to make sure we caught it. That, that, that about the cross-cultural... Except Peter, if you're there, my recording is frozen. Um, okay, that, so we're, I think we're, we're we're back on. I've just got the message: your com your connection is unstable. Are you? Yeah, I am. Also, me? My connection, yes, it's it's going in and out. I'm I'm just double checking that. We'll just edit this. Hopefully, it's fine. I'm seeing if there's anything I can change. Yeah. Sorry about this. this, is the, this is no, that's all right. Technology. Could, look, it could be. It could be um, it could be my Wi-Fi here as well. Uh, no, the signal's uh, looking okay. Yeah, it's looking okay now. So, you, so you were 
yeah, I, I, I think the recording might have got it, but I, I wanted to be sure, you know, the, the what, what we say about that. Obviously, so in a way we could summarize part of what you're saying is that it's not relativism, but rather in a way a sort of very deep form of humility that it arises from your own work in the sense that your work sort of, it doesn't suggest all everything's up for grabs, but rather we need to relativize our own culture and our own assumptions about the ways in which we should just generalize Western modern academic categories is itself a sort of, you know, not intentionally, but ultimately an arrogant and actually unscientific in the sense of it's, it's, it's a mistake. We need to figure out how to do scholarship without assuming that the tools we're using are good for every period or is that a fair summary? Yeah, no, look, I, th- I think that that is a fair summary. And it, look, if I can add to that, and, and again, this is the work I'm, the, I'm presently doing is, is making this clear. What, what, you've, what I think we have in the modern West is a combination of two things. We have this set of categories that we, we tend to think is, is universal, but that's, that's kind of underpinned by a historical thesis of progress that sees the West either implicitly or explicitly as the, as the kind of, you know, the, 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 the pinnacle of, 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 achi- of, 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 you know, human achievement. And that underlying assumption, it, it's, which starts from the Enlightenment and builds through the 19th century, I think that underpins most of our academic enterprises. And so there's a, there's a kind of imperialistic assumption about the superiority of the intellectual apparatus they were operating with. And that's, it's not, that's completely consistent with, at some level, an understanding of the importance of other cultures. But until we dig r- deeply down, we don't understand just how or it's difficult to understand just just how specific our approach is, um, and and the fact that our, our assumptions about its universality arise out of a set of historical assumptions about progress and the West, and you know conceptions of rationality as being especially epitomised by Western secular culture, and 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 there are a whole range of historical you know broad historical theses from you know positivists like Kant to Hegel to to anthropological theories, um, all of which uh, are manifestations of this assumption that there's something quite specific and unique about the West's history by virtue of which its its intellectual approach is is the one. Right. And that, that then leads on to naturally sort of questions about what we call science itself. So, Obviously, you sort of established this and it's well known in the field, but for those listening or, or watching and learning this for the first time, what we call natural science, science as a word in English is very new, coined in the mid 19th century, um, maybe not becoming dominant until even the early 20th century. Historically, it's part of natural philosophy. Natural philosophy is broadly part of philosophy, just as theology is, is part of philosophy. And therefore, this very deep connection that you mentioned it was part of your early work. So in terms of the science and its own history, I, I think I know your answer to the first question, but I'll ask two questions. The first is, do you think the practice of the natural sciences should attend to its history? And if you do, why do you think it doesn't? So look, it, it's, it's a really interesting question about whether the practice of the modern sciences should should attend to its history. I think if it wants to have an understanding of its significance and its limits, crucially, it, 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 has, to, it has to attend to its history. By the same token, you know, as a set of practices, it, to some extent for me, the modern sciences are fine as they are. You know, it, it, they, are, they are what they are, and, and at some level they deliver remarkable things, you know, um, and, and so there's, there is a connection between science and technology. I think that the, the, the contributions that the natural sciences have made to the improvement of material welfare are, are un, unquestionable, and there is something very special about the, the modern sciences. And interestingly, to go back to the previous point, it, uh, notions of human progress and the sum that the West represents the epitome of progress are almost invariably linked to the sciences and the, the conception of progress that we see the sciences, we imagine the sciences to embody. And to that extent, I think for practising sciences, scientists to be attending to their history is, would be useful. But 
it, it, it wouldn't necessarily impact on the specific way in practices of science. Um, and, and so I, I don't want to be seen here as, as a critic of, of the modern sciences, but in, in kind of ideological terms, the, one of the consequences of, of the success of the sciences is that we have a particular model of what progress and success consists in, and that's understood in these material terms and in terms of human welfare. And that's often conflated with um, science as a model for accessing truth in some sense, right? And I don't think the sciences do that. I don't think the sciences, you know, do that. And that, that, that might sound like a big claim, but it's really crucial to tease apart the utility of the sciences and the incredible advances in a particular way that the sciences have made and, and attempt to conflate that with the sciences as somehow a model for, uh, you know, finding out the nature of reality, which I think is completely wrong and completely mistaken. Um, so, uh, and what attending to the history of the sciences would establish, I think, is in part that there is this huge gap between the utility of the sciences and, and the notion of the sciences as somehow uh, pointing us in the direction of some ultimate truth about the world. Because even at a very superficial level, um, we can see that scientific progress does not entail um, a, a more accurate picture of what's actually going on in the world. And this is the story of Tom, that Thomas Kuhn told, I think, extremely well, certainly in relation to some aspects of the sciences, that, that scientific revolutions give us a different picture of the world, but it's not clear that the succession of different pictures of the world that we get through history are homing in on some particular more refined version of reality, the different versions of, of reality. So now I answer the first part of your question. Sorry, it's, there's a freezing happening. Yeah, now we, we're back. Yep. Yeah. But no, you know that you were because you 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 answered both, which was sort of whether they should, which you, you sort of indicated it's, it's complicated. In one sense, you know, they're fine as they are, but in another sense, if they want to understand their significance, um, they they really ought to. And then now this is, I think, Peter, what you said just now is very significant, and I think will would be controversial to many. So if you don't mind, let's kind of dig into it. I. Is, I think, right, the, the sciences, their, their main defense of the natural sciences is indeed their utility. And you, you recognize that and you say this is undeniable. However, then you say this is very different from the idea that they're giving us sort of access to sort of a truthful description of the world. However, that is, I think you would concede, the perspective of most practicing natural scientists, um, not someone, for example, like Tom McLeish, who, who I mentioned I just talked to. He's very aware because he knows the history of science in a way that is maybe exceptional for practicing natural scientists today, he himself said when we discussed this, and he said in some of his books, the history of science in many ways is the history of error. I, but ideally, it's like productive error, sort of agreeing right. only in that level with uh, someone like Popper, who in many ways, of course, McLeish, I think like many of us, thinks got most of those issues not quite right. So if it's not getting us truth but scientists think it's getting at truth what what do you what is its sort of epistemic utility or how do we get at truth if it's not through this one institution or set of practices that sort of culturally itself thinks it's sort of the great truth-giving enterprise and that our culture in many ways accepts is the great truth-giving enterprise yeah yeah okay look so let, let, let me, I should perhaps go back to the question about the extent to which the history of science is relevant to the practice of science. And, and perhaps I dismissed too quickly why, why the history of science might be relevant. And I think why the history of science is relevant is that if, if, if practicing scientists are aware of, of the significance of, of changes, of so what Kuhn referred to as these paradigmatic revolutions, all sorts of problems with that concept, but what, what it would enable them to do as practising scientists is to see that, that where, to put it again in Kuhnian language, where anomalies keep cropping up in, in what we might call normal science. So, so you know, from some 
for, if you take contemporary physics, for example, there, you know, there are obvious, from my perspective as an outsider, there are clear problems with contemporary physics in terms of just doesn't all fit together. Now, one, one approach, the approach of normal science, would be to keep plugging away at the standard model, as it were, and, and keep bolting on bits and pieces that attempt to, to fix up these, th these anomalies. But what the history of science suggests is that the reason there are all of these anomalies and doesn't quite work is that the fundamental theory is mistaken, right? And that in, in maybe 200 years' time, there'll be a whole other paradigm that will account for at least some of these, but then that will that, that itself will be then subject to change. So what the history of what the history of science could be useful for for practicing sciences is to realize when the current model is really exhausted. Um, and that in spite of all of the all of the practical spin-offs, and we've seen wrong theories in the past give us technologies and practical spin-offs. And that's, a, a, again, the problem of conflating utility with truth. So there is something, I think, for practising scientists to learn about the history in terms of the potential for new, you know, new big, big, big paradigms or models. Uh, and when working away at bolting on ad hoc uh, uh, epicycles to an existing model is no longer going to do the job. But that that's, as I say, for the most part, I think scientists operate with um, and, and very often those sorts of pushes come as a result of reflection on philosophical conceptions. And I think that was the case certainly for the generation of physicists who, who, who introduced, you know, the new physics at, at, at the turn of the... Um, of the 20th century. Um, so look, so uh, that, that's a clarification on the previous question. Now, um, to go back to this question of truth and utility, um, you know, how do we get, well, the, the, um, it, it's, it's perhaps worth saying just a tiny bit more about about this, um, so that, you know, here's a good example of the the difference between truth and utility. If you want to navigate the London Underground, you use the tube map, right? Wonderful thing, terrific way of getting around. But that tube map is a is a very very poor depiction of the geographical territory that that's that's going on there. But if you were to use a kind of land map that shows the the, the tube lines, you, you you'd never get anywhere. So the we, we, but we can but no one thinks that the tube map is a representation of the kind of geography of, of London, but you use it because it's a terrific way of, of navigating the system, and and the same is true for our scientific theories that they they give us a terrific way of getting doing things and getting to places, but the mistake is to conflate them with the actual territory, and so I think part part of the to, to come back to your question, you know, this is Pilot's question. What, what is truth? You know, <laughs> I'm not going to answer that for. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that for you right now in this interview. Right? But what I what I can say is that that um, and this is part, partly my. It, it, we can sort of clean clean away things if we under once we understand that science is not you know, the, the sole method of coming up with reliable knowledge, and it's certainly not the sole method of arriving at truth, we're at least part of the way there. And so I think it, that that is one modest step in, in the right direction. You know, philosophy has always attempted to answer these questions and religion has attempted to answer these questions. And to some extent, I think, I'm not suggesting there is their progress in, in philosophy is a big is a is a big question, but I do think there are certain insights that we get from from philosophy and and from theology that we don't get from the sciences that are actually important. And because science is occupying all the epistemic space, it's not possible for these, uh, you know, kind of essentially marginal enterprises to get the kind of airplay that they should have. Peter, I think this is so helpful and it's profound because what we're discussing and what you're addressing, I, I think in a way that's going to be very helpful for many people, particularly people who have, I think, struggled with these issues or will if they begin to study them, is it's at the heart of what we're trying to do together in the, in the Meetings of Science project, which is, of course, all of us involved are deep admirers of the incredible success of the natural sciences. No one involved in this project is in any way critical or anti-scientific.
However, we all share a concern about the way in which the natural sciences understand themselves or are publicly represented. And that concern arises out of, you could say, the scientific issue of the fact that those self-representations or those historical images are, as Kuhn said, you could say textbook science. They're not actually based on real history. And so we sort of just want, if it's fair to summarize the project and you and I as the directors, we want just a more com comprehensive, inclusive, and you could say humble image of what science is that lets sort of the broader history of its own project as part of the project of philosophy. And in a way, as you in particular have shown, part of the history of, of religion, it just maybe to let those voices have a sort of broad relevance. Um, so I think that that is very important. And, and of course, it is a hard question. It made me think when you're answering of Bacon, you know, what is truth as Justin Pilate and did not wait for an answer. So of course, that's a terribly hard question <laughs> to ask anyone. Um,